Well, I'm sad Christian and Chase are not here. Um, so this section is the first, the first section in the second book where we start talking about the will, the thing in itself. Um, I have a very broad initial question, but um, I'm also like, I, I guess the first thing I'll ask is there any question or issue or passage that anybody has a, a desire to start with, something you've been stewing over or thinking about in this section? Can I, can I just throw out a couple of facetious comments? Sure. From, from this reading? Um, well, we learned from this reading that Schopenhauer is perplexed as to how babies are made. And he's really, he's really feels uncomfortable and anxious at parties. It, he feels uncomfortable with what? And anxious at parties. I still didn't get that. He's anxious at parties. When oh, he's, he's anxious at parties. At parties. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, I am too. <laughs> Yeah, but I do have too. one up on Schopenhauer, and you know where babies come from. <laughs> True. Yeah. yeah. Are you serious, Eric? Where I I I, I missed uh, Schopenhauer Schopenhauer's um, confusion. Not that I'm sure that's not necessarily the core of this reading, but <laughs> um, the gen on uh, page one twenty one near the top it's the it's the first full sentence that, that's that starts on that page these sciences are not primarily concerned with the transition of matter into these forms the genesis of the individual since each individual originates from others similar to itself through procreation which is equally mysterious everywhere and has so far eluded attempts at clear knowledge <laughs> he does he's, he's he finds how babies are made a mystery I mean, no, I, I understand that. Like at, the, at the time he's writing, he's trying to be more specific about the generative process. And that, at the time he's writing, mysterious. But I thought it'd be fun to have a dig and say, he doesn't know how babies are made. Because <laughs> it's showing up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me want to speculate about his love life, but... Or lack thereof, but that's right. That's right. Like you get in this picture of this loser that nobody likes. <laughs> well, I mean, look at the you know, look at the picture. I mean, God. <laughs> Although when you know, if you look at pictures of him when he's a young man, he actually looks pretty attractive. You know, so I mean, we know a little bit about Nietzsche's social life. I don't know if we know anything about Schopenhauer's social life. I don't know. Oh, really? Schopenhauer was pretty promiscuous. Is that right? <laughs> Wow, I didn't know that. So maybe <laughs> interesting. Hmm. Maybe he maybe he just let maybe these women that he had flings with, some of them had babies and some didn't. He was like, what's up with that? I don't get that. <laughs> what Actually, happened there? I honestly we weren't even married. Well, That's remember, right, we weren't even married. We weren't married. <laughs> <laughs> but remember. I remember reading somewhere where the ancient Greeks were able to connect part of the dots to say, obviously, the man has everything to do with procreation because of, you know, semen, but they honestly didn't have a conception that the woman contributed anything biologically except being a host. I think and that's I'm curious is where, when in biological knowledge you know, to get really specific, where was this sense of, oh, no, no, and female egg is actually being, you know, um, fertilized. I mean, how, when did that happen um, in the 17 or eight? I mean, I mean, I'm guessing it would have happened, it's a pure guess that it happened no earlier than the 1700s. I imagine in the, in the interim period between ancient Greece and whenever they did figure out the mechanism of the egg, there had to be suspicions with all the children coming out with traits that bear that come from the mother. You know what I mean? But on no, the ancient would... Greek picture, it'd be difficult to explain 
all of you know all these kids that come out looking nothing like the father. Eric, it's a, it's a real it's a real simple explanation. She's a witch. I mean, come on, why why do you have to go and dig and dig and dig? It's right obvious. She makes her children look like her. There you go. Problem solved. Yeah, right. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't know. Well, but, um, this is just, like I said, a really general question, but I, it drives the first, at least the first section. No, actually, it, at least the, actually, it drives most of this, this reading, uh, li either directly or indirectly. On the first page, on page uh, 119, he says, uh, this is like halfway through the first paragraph. We will particular we'll be particularly particularly interested in discovering the true meaning of intuitive representations. We have only ever felt this meaning before, but this has ensured that the images do not pass by us strange and meaningless as they otherwise necessarily have done. Rather, they speak and are immediately understood and have an interest that engages our entire being. So, my you know my initial question is, what is he? What does he mean by true meaning? Um, you know, he says we need to figure out what the true meaning of intuitive representation is. You know, what does the word meaning there mean? I mean, maybe it's obvious, but I mean, but, you know, he goes through and he says, well, let's look at mathematics. Nope, that's not where the true meaning is. Let's look at the natural sciences. Nope, that's not where the true meaning is. You know, he goes to these different candidates and says and explains why it can't be this, why it can't be, why the meaning can't be there, why it can't be there. And then eventually he comes up, you know, well, it must be in this notion of the will. But, you know, what what does he mean by meaning? What's he looking for there? I, I mean, I was reading it and I don't necessarily know how his will answers this question, but given that he's. Yeah, he's trying to kind of like peer back behind the veil. I get the sense that it almost, I was reading it as almost like existential or almost like spiritual of just like, why are we here? You know, what is my existence compared to, to the universal will? Um, and then just the, the context of him kind of shedding light on all these forms of exploring cause and effect and representations, like not, not being satisfying, like, I feel like he kind of just points to this this sense like he's looking for some sort of like I guess it's, I, I feel like I I want to shift it from existential to spiritual just because I know he has that relation with like Eastern thought, which I think maybe provides that spin for him, although I don't see that maybe being as apparent in these writings, but I mean, you know what I think like there's a part of me that says we'll be particularly interested in discovering the true meaning. Um, and it's like, who? All of us? Are we? <laughs> but I mean, you know, I think I look around me and I, I think it's resonant. You, you hear people say that of just being dissatisfied with looking around and you get all this kind of mechanistic explanation, but I guess no real like direction. Um, and I, again, I was saying, I don't know if his will would answer that question, but that's how I was reading it. I don't know if, if it's correct. Are you, so are you saying that he's saying we know this through our intuition, you think? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's interesting he's saying that right there, right? Like we felt this, but how do we kind of lift it into abstraction? How do we know it? Um, and I, I guess... And again, like I haven't seen him directly say these. Maybe he's hinted at this. Scent. Like again, when I think of uh, like Eastern thought, Buddhism, Hinduism, like I feel like I have associations with those traditions of like you know this kind of like intuitive approach of kind of like turning inward and knowing it. And so I can almost see like maybe he's writing from some of that influence, which is to say like I think he does feel like we have this like direct immediate awareness of it. Um, which I think is for him is almost like underneath intuitive representation, but it's like immediate. Yeah, I get you know one or one issue probably be careful with is the the, the meaning of the word intuition. Um, you know, like so it sounds like 
when you were using the word intuition, Joey, you were using it in the way that uh, Kant and Schopenhauer use it, like in this sentence, we will be particularly interested in discovering the true meaning of intuitive representation. And those I take, again, I keep, I'm relying on this notion that, that um, Alastair pr presented in Kant is that intu intuitive representations are kind of the immediate experience of sensory particulars that are, have not yet, yet been um, categorized or systematized. And so their in, intuition, so I, the reason I say that is because we, you know, we tend to, in, in common language today, we people will use intuition in the sense of an intuitive perception of the ultimate ground of reality or something like that, or an intuitive perception of God or intuitive perception of spiritual truth. But in the meaning of intuition here, that's not what he means. He's, this notion of intuition is the immediate, I think, the immediate perception of, of sensory um, particulars. That, that makes sense to me. I guess I'm, I'm running up against a wall because I feel like he refers to the body as immediate in contrast to representations, which I'm, I'm, I am pairing with intuition. And I'm wondering, is would it be fair to say that he's not saying intuition is immediate or is it? So I think what, you know, what I, what I think, what I picked up earlier in the book when he, when he uses intuit, intuitive, that he calls the body in, or he, you know, he, he talks about intuitive, um what's the word intuitive what that you said intuitive representation representation that that is that only counts for the body um or no the immediate object that's what it is the immediate the immediate object only counts in the case of the body that we the body is the only the only object that we have an, an immediate intuition of and that's i think that's confirmed in this section when he's referring back to things he said in um in the the book about the um principle of sufficient reason he said there i called the body you know this immediate object and i think he's still using that in that in that notion of intuition in that sense of um so when i when i when i when i have an intuition of particular objects that's the immediate sensory experience of particular things. And I think what he's saying is the physical body, the body is the only object that I have an immediate intuition of because it's not mediated by any other, you know, so like my sensory intuition. Does he, of, of does he use the word intuition there? I guess. What's that? I'm wondering, does he use the word intuition there? Does he say we intuit immediately? I the think body, so. Kind of like feeling within it? The, the body as object, we intuit immediately. The body as will, I don't, I don't know if he's going to be going to say that we intuit. Although he does seem to say some, some, he does seem to indicate that we kind of have an intuition of our of our will. But I think you know the word that he used in that pass that little thing I read on page one nineteen you know, was, you know, as Joey pointed out, he says, we'll be particularly interested in discovering the true meaning of intuitive representation. We have only ever felt this meaning before. And I think that felt there is the, the more uh, contemporary notion of intuition. It's something you feel, not something you cognize. And so I think he does have a place for that. It's just that I don't think he he call, I don't think he calls that intuition. He just says we have this immediate direct feeling. Um, and I think what he would say about the body is we have both an immediate sensory intuition, which just means as an object, I sense it immediately as an object. But then I also have this immediate feeling, which I experience as manifestations of the will that that makes sense to me in that passage right i'm wondering like what is the language that he uses later on it's not like present in my mind right now um but yeah i think i was shying away from the word intuition because i feel like my impression is that for him intuition is kind of placed within representation and like subject object dichotomy and cause and effect. Whereas I think that felt sense 
with the body is kind of, I don't know if we would use the word prior, but like different, altogether different, completely different. No, I think you're right. I think you're totally right. But he uses the word intuition. Intuition is something that happens in the subject object domain, whereas whatever this other, I'm not sh sure what to call it, this other aspect of the body is something we feel rather, rather than into it. Yeah, this, so if, the, if, let's see, the, the very bottom of page 124, the last partial sentence, an act of the will and an act of the body are not two different states cognized objectively linked together in a causal chain. They do not stand in a relation of cause and effect. And I think he's trying to say there, they're not something that is in the, like, like you said, is in the, that is cognized through the understanding, because that's the domain of cause and effect. They are one and the same, only given in two entirely different ways. In one case, immediately, and in the other case, to the understanding in intuition. And I think that's that latter one, understanding and intuition is the body as physical object. An action of the body is nothing but objectified act of the will, that is an act of the will that has entered intuition. Furthermore, we will see that this is true of all bodily motion, not just motivated action, but even involuntary acts. The entire body is nothing but objectified will, will that has become representation. And then this is where he mentions the immediate object. That is why I now call the body the objecthood of the will. Although in the previous book and in the essay, which was book one, uh, and in the essay on principle of sufficient reason, I called it the immediate object in keeping with the intentionality, intentionally the one-sided standpoint I adopted there. So there he's saying, you know, this thing that I called the immediate object in book one, I am now calling the objecthood of the will, but it's still the body. What, what the body is, is the that, immediate object. What page is that, Nevin? Uh, that was page 125. Okay, thanks. Right down, up at the top. Um, I haven't reread it in this moment, but the one section I did have question marks next to was at the bottom of 125. So I'm looking at him kind of talking about the pain and pleasure stuff, the pain and pleasure stuff and the, the reference to like impressions and immediate affections. Um, but yeah, the, the pain, and I guess, you know, I was kind of like wondering if there was any sort of like connection to Spinoza there, but I don't think that's why my question marks are there. I think I was maybe confused by the distinction he was making. Um, but he uses, uh, you know, the, 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 the paragraph you were talking about um, at the bottom, Joey, he, he uses the word mere representations, right? There are only a few specific impressions on the body that can be immediately considered as mere representations and are thus exceptions to what has just been said. I mean, usually when people use the word mere, they're saying that they're less important than other things, right? And so it seems to me that he's saying the representation is not as important as other processes i i don't know what word to use maybe that's related to that you know my my question about what is the, the true meaning of intuitive representations because if intuitive representations like you say are mere representations then maybe the true meaning is something other than a mere representation um, I think on Schopenhauer's language, most representations are not mere representations. What he's saying here is only a few are mere. The, what differentiates a mere representation from all the rest is that the rest of the representations are expressions of will. I thought all representations were expressions of will. Right. Well, the, the, mere, the mere representations, he's, he's saying, do not, well, do not stimulate the will. They have a less direct they're not a direct expression of the will or um work on the will 
what do you mean? What I get, I'm getting is mean here that these are mere, mere sensations and have only an indirect, if if at all, relationship to the will. Most most mm. other representations are expressions of will. Mm. Right, and then these ones are just affectations on the body, if you like, affectations on the body that have little or nothing to do with the will as such, which are not most of the affectations on the body. Right. Yeah, I guess that was interesting. Just that, I guess that distinction, right, of almost as if there's a threshold of stimulation needed to to be. Oh, I mean, I I don't think I don't know if this is accurate, but what came to my mind was um, most representations being expressions of will. You could easily. You know, you hear, you feel your stomach grumble, you hear your stomach grumble, and you know you're hungry. You need to put some food in there, right? You could call that an expression of your will, right? To get more food in your body. Um, and and I want to say the, the ones he's calling mere representations are almost like Lockean secondary qualities that are read off of phenomena, but don't have any, any term, anything to do in to do with like volitional action as such. Yeah, on the next page, he said like it involves such an exceptionally weak stimulation to the enhanced and specifically modified sensibility of these parts that it does not affect the wills. No stimulation disturbs the will. This simply delivers to the understanding the data that become intuition. And right before that, he, he says, what I have in mind are the affections of the purely objective sense of sight, hearing and touch and only to the extent that these organs are affected in ways that are specific, natural, and fitting. And then that what you read. So it sounds to me it's almost like like something like raw sense data. Uh, that uh, What's well, interesting, I, I don't know if, I don't know what he would attribute this to, right? He says weakness of nerve. I just thought that was interesting. Weakness of nerves manifests itself when impressions that should have just enough strength to serve as data are in fact strong enough to move the will. So like a system, a body that's moved by something, say, as simple as a color. Creating pain or pleasure. <laughs> yeah, then he says, uh, this pain is somewhat dull and indistinct. So not only are certain noises and strong lights perceived as painful, but a general sort of sickly hypochondriac temper arises. I don't know. It sounds like weakness of nerves is something like when just regular old everyday sensory perceptions cause pain or, you know, something like that. Like maybe like soup, like hypersensitivity to light or. I mean, some people who are maybe sensitive to sound kind of based on their system, maybe being overactivated. Or... Yeah, I was I was thinking of shell shock World War One guys. Uh -huh. They were they were they were a lot what they were diagnosed for having weak nerves right, um, before they actually had the term. Um, well, they had the they, they we got the term shell shock right, but before that it was oh you just weak nerves you have you're just weak constitution. Yeah, yeah I think I was wondering that. if there's like a moral flavor or moral layer on there for Schopenhauer, but considering that he is you know very, I guess kind of interested in this like. His body biological perspectives a part of me like wants to have more a sympathetic reading and just like that's his way of describing it of just oh yeah those nerves are weak and so they're affected easily <laughs> yeah maybe uh, just a maybe a physiological description rather than a sort of moral judgment i that's hard to tell I tend to think of him as a really judgy guy, so, but, <laughs> but that may, may not be fair. <laughs> this, I mean, this passage actually did kind of remind me of Buddhism. I mean, I, since he had read some of this stuff, it makes me wonder, you know, how much was like, what little, I keep getting these little bits and pieces that seem to be related to Buddhism. And I don't know if that's, if that's actually true, or if he just happened to you know, get on get on a, a similar train of thought as as they did. Maybe that's why then he maybe read Buddhism and went, "Oh, look, this is very similar to me." But um, this is not exactly the same. But you know, you know, in Buddhist psychology, um, 
one thing they would disagree with is they, I think they would say every stimulation we experience as it has a valence to it, a positive or negative valence, meaning some, you know, that we, we, we are attracted to it or we are repulsed by it. And he seems to deny that, you know, that these, this sort of raw sensory data it isn't, doesn't go either, either way. But then where they seem to be similar is that, you know, the, if, at least on my interpretation, the basic definition of suffering for Buddhism is anything that opposes your will. And so it's like suffering is either me not wanting things to be the way they are or wanting things to be the way they aren't. So, you know, however I want it to be, suffering is things not being that way. <laughs> and that seems to be very similar to what he's saying here, you know, that if you, when things are going along with your will, you we experience that as pleasure. When things are opposing your will, we experience that as pain. Um, although I'm not sure the exact things, but it's hearing you talk, Nevid is reminding me of what he was going over when he was talking about stoicism. I don't remember if he was like agreeing with it or not, but it sounds it's reminding me of it. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the main main planks of stoicism too, isn't it, Nevin? Uh, I don't I don't it? know stoicism well, so right, right. But one oh, okay, so wanting the world to be otherwise than it is. Mm. Um as as the cause of suffering like you can't change your circumstances but you can change how you relate to your circumstances uh and that was that was one of the big ideas he was kind of also pulling out from stoicism and, and positively and and expressly here like he's saying it, it's it reminded me of spinoza as well i think joey was right to draw that connection in joe in spinoza if i remember correctly pleasure and pain were associated with the increasing of one's own power Right, pleasure is what increases your own, and pain is what decreases your power. Right, and then here it's Schopenhauer's your will. Right, pleasure is what agrees with your will, and pain is what disagrees with your will. If we see, if you if you just relate, you know, translate the will to your power, right, the power, you know, your power to exert yourself. I mean, I've. After reading this section, by the way, I, I, I felt like I was an exact mid. I was at an exact midpoint between Kant and Nietzsche, but huh. you know what I mean. Because already it feels like it takes Spinoza's, you know, talking about increasing power, and that is what pleasure is, right? It amounts to see it right next to Spinoza's will, pleasure, and pain. It seems like we're, you know, very close to formulating something like will to power. Yep, I, I get, you know, I don't know whether, you know, I'm reading Nietzsche into Schopenhauer or, or reading or, or, or finding Schopenhauer in Nietzsche. I, it, it's hard for me to tell because I, I agree. I find, you know, why, why does anybody read Schopenhauer anyway? <laughs> well, yeah, <good. laughs> yeah, no, honestly, if not for Nietzsche, uh, it's, it's questionable how how you know how much of a legacy. Sh I know Schopenhauer was uh, celebrated in his own right towards the end of the nineteenth century and early early part of the twentieth century, but this was around about the same time that Nietzsche was also being hmm. celebrated. Yeah, and you know, I you know, my get, I I think actually, you know, Joey, the the, the Stoic connection is probably a better one than Buddhism because I I had forgot. It's just that I I you know I know. Buddhism a little better than I know Stoicism, so that's what came into my mind. But given that he had just been talking about, like, literally just been talking about Stoicism in the previous, I mean, I I think that is fair, but I think it's maybe just as much. You know, I don't know if he's if he's going to get into explicit references of I don't know Buddhism, Hinduism, Eastern thought, but like secondary sources that I've listened to, read, mentioned that you know he's definitely reading it at this time. And so mm. it's like in his mind. And I, I think for him, like Plato and Eastern thought, like, you know, they kind of like are saying a lot of the similar things. And so I think that's, I think he's, you know, those ideas are probably there, even though he's not directly referencing them. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes these ideas, I can't remember, I've run into this before, but they, when people ask, well, oh gosh, did he read this guy or that guy? But sometimes 
these ideas are floating around in the intellectual culture. They're kind of in the zeitgeist. And so uh, it's hard to know sometimes where, you know, where people pick up this stuff. I've listened to a podcast on like Schopenhauer's lifestyle and it is just like, <laughs> it was pretty unbelievable. I mean, I think he's famous already for that uh, lecturing at the same time as Hegel. Um, but listening to like his whole life and how that plugs in just the context of who he is as a person, it's just like he was so stubborn and just ridiculously stubborn about it. Um, but yeah, he had he had two dogs. He named both of them Atman and they were his poodles. And when he died, he left like a bunch of money to his dog. <laughs> uh, but apparently in his later years, and this was referenced alongside the whole uh, people setting their clock, their clocks according to Kant's walk. Apparently Schopenhauer was like that as well, if not even further. Apparently every single morning he woke up and read, he went and got lunch at the same place, played his flute, went to like social gatherings, like to see music or like just like he was very kind of like social and lively with his like evenings. And then he would go to bed every single night reading like the Bhagavad Gita or some sort of like Eastern Bhagavad. It's like just this like repetitive pattern. Makes you wonder if he was on the spectrum. I know people have asked that about Kant too. But <clears throat> there's there's quotes that he has of like because people will look at that lifestyle and be like, why didn't he like try to do the ascetic thing and like deny his will and, and do what he preaches? And he kind of gives this example of uh he's like the artist doesn't have to be beautiful to to create beautiful things. Just basically excusing, like, I don't have to live by my philosophy. Like, that's not what a philosopher does. Because <laughs> apparently he lived, like, kind of quite extravagantly in his later mm -hmm. years of just enjoying socialities and the wealth and the fame. Like, he really appreciated getting famous. He loved it. That's hilarious. <laughs> about carrying on with where we were i was looking at 127 and i guess in the back of my head like i'm like oh cool yeah ooh, fun you know spinoza connection nietzsche connection but I, I guess i still sit just like i'm you know i'm trying to like feel into the universal will and the interior of my body you know prior to object so and i'm like i don't know you know, like what's, I guess I'm wondering, like, is there an argument? And I'm looking at 127 and is he kind of just saying like, no, I'm going to argue this. It's just immediate. You know, we, we don't, we don't make an ar argument for it. Philosophical truth. Um, what does he say? Like we, we, uh, I'm looking at this line, the most immediate cognition there is. If we do not grasp it as such and keep hold of it, we will wait in vain to get it back again somehow in immediate way. I almost seeing him saying like don't wait for an argument <laughs> like just just feel it i don't i don't know but i'm wondering too because at the beginning of that paragraph he says we've we've presented the identity of the will and the body only provisionally um and then he kind of goes on to say like it can only be established by raising immediate consciousness concrete cognition to rational knowledge or transferring it to abstract cognition which i'm reading is him saying like trying to pull this out of something felt and make it abstract um and i don't know he, he makes it sound like this is what we're going to do here we haven't quite done it but i guess maybe that that passage to me was confusing of like is he saying that there's no argument needed for it what is like pulling it into abstraction mean transferring it to abstract cognition not sure this is kind of approaching that from what I regard as to be like one of the, the crux of the issue here, right? Um, he he claims the will is not representational. It is not a representation. And so I, I read what he's trying to say here is like, I can't represent to you a line of argument that this, you know, of this, his argument of identity, right? The You know, the identity of the will with the thing in itself. Um, or the will with this, what he claims is an immediate intuition. 
um, of ourselves, right? Willing, um, which is not a representation. But when we put a name on it, will, right? We've given it, we've, we've lift, we've, we've pulled it, we've pulled it, we've, we've shrouded it in, in representational clothing in order to communicate, right? Like, so he has, he has to put a word on it in order to communicate, but words will not do the work of demonstrating or, you know, um, deducing the line of argument he's doing. It, 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 even if it's not an argument, right? It's, 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 it is basically like, I hate, to, I, I, I can't, it feels like he's just pronouncing, you know what I mean? Like he is just positing his identity um, and then saying, I can't, you know, I can't logically rigorously argue with concepts, right? That this is the case. Because this thing is fundamentally a non-representational thing. Um, but it makes it hard for, I mean, makes it hard, makes it hard to follow it. You know what I mean, or or to to tease out the implications. Because I w I want to say on the first reading, you can just kind of be like, that's makes sense. I can follow you. I can follow you. But then when you sit back and you think, well, what just happened there? Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? What it it, 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 it he does describe it this way, right? You you can lose it immediately, or you can lose it like a fleeting thing. This right? And I I I I, I think I can get a glimmer of what he's saying. But if I try to conceptualize it logically, it still seems to, the more I investigate it, the more it disintegrates. And I still, I'm still led to this question. He's talking about us having this kind of knowledge of our will, which I'm having a hard time thinking is possible if the will is non-representational. And it seems to me like all knowledge has to be bound up in concepts and some kind of form of representation and something to make it communicable. So I think, I mean, I think he does give us an argument. Um, in fact, I think the, ne the next pages are an argument supporting his assertion that the thing in itself is the will. So it seems to me he does what he's saying you would have to do here, which is try to lift this immediate feeling into cognition. And I think he's also aware of the fact that in so doing, you are not representing the thing itself because you can't. And so it seems to me he's he's acknowledging that. And I, you know, what I take here, so I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of the beginning of Beyond Good and Evil 36 from Nietzsche. He says, assuming that our world of desires and passions is the only thing given as real, that we cannot get down up or down to any reality except the reality of our drives, since thinking is only a relation between these drives. Aren't we allowed to make the attempt and pose the question as to whether something like this given isn't enough to render the so-called mechanistic and thus material world comprehensive as well? And then so, and he goes on. I mean, it's a very Schopenhauerian passage, even though he 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 uh, he says he doesn't he doesn't he's not talking about mere appearance in the sense that Schopenhauer uses the term. But I think, you know what, Schop I mean, if if I'm reading Schopenhauer right, I'm reading him maybe too much through Nietzsche, I don't know. But all he's talking about is our experience literally of desires, passions, drives, that, that those are, they're not the will, because you can't experience the will you know, immediately, but what you experience are the way, is the way the will manifests in the field of representation. And that, and, and we have a direct, immediate awareness of that in our passions, our choosing, our desires, and those kinds of things. And I think when he said, you know, so I, at least on that reading, um, you know, to say, no, I don't experience anything like that. I think he would just say, you're just being ridiculous. Because clearly you do have feelings. You do have desires. You do have drives. And you experience those things. And, you know, and, the, the, and then, you know, so then you say, well, 
yeah, but convince, but how are you going to convince me that those are manifestations of a will that underlies those things? And I think he tries to do that in the next few pages is he tries to give you a, an argument. And I frankly have a hard time following his argument there. So I can't, I can't, I guess we say how, how successful it is, but I think he does try to give a kind of argument. And this is in section 19 that you're referring to, because I'm wondering, I, I see him like making the argument, like what right do we have to generalize, you know, the, the privilege inside that I experienced kind of inside my body? What right do we have to kind of like apply that across the world? And I guess I'm seeing he kind of is giving this argument here. Yeah, uh, around the, the theoretical egoism, and he's kind of just saying, like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> no one has time for that, practically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think you're right. You know, I think that's a good a good way to put it. You know, he says, well, then, you know, you might say, yeah, it's crazy for me to generalize this and say that this is a manifestation of some will. But then he claims, well, there's only these two alternatives, and one of them is ridiculous because it it results in solipsism. And, you know, he's kind of like, okay, if you want to go down the solipsistic route, be my guest. But that's a dead end. You know, and the all, and I, and again, you know, this may be a false dilemma or a false dichotomy, but the only, he thinks the only option left then is, is the one he's providing. I guess I'm also recalling that, you know, it's like, oh, you know, what is, what does he even mean by will? And I'm thinking like, I, I think part of him is just proposing it as an alternative to you know, the, the thing in itself, as if it's an object that's causing something, you know, again, the will is something different from that, which I still feel like it's, it still kind of has this like mysterious kind of cloud or shroud around it. And then I'm recalling to, and I, I found this section, this is towards the end of our reading on page 136, where he says like, it would be ridiculous to think that what I'm referring to as the will is like, like a human intention a human motivation type thing. And he kind of says like, you know, it requires us to a broadening of this kind of term of what we're understanding by it. And I guess I kind of, I paired that to, I feel like, I think that's in the very, that's in the same section where he said something about like, why couldn't I just use any word to refer to this thing? Um, and he's kind of saying like, I couldn't do that. Um, you know, it only, it makes sense as this word. Hopefully you, you see that it makes sense as this word. I don't remember exactly what he says, but um, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of ex still exploring that. And that, that, that point you're point uh, that page you're pointing to, Joey. I was about to point to the same page um, because I I I'm with the way uh Nevit was just describing it in terms of we well, we we have access to our drives and our passions. We don't deny those, right? And then we we extrapolate. Here's the thing that there's a will behind it, right? But it's that seems like a process of inference. And it seems like Schopenhauer is saying we don't infer a will. In, in right there on uh 136. He there and not just here, but other points. He wants to say we we have immediate access and knowledge of immediate access to and knowledge of will. And, and yet it's a thing in itself as well it's so in in on a number i mean bring it up and put it down if you you know it's flatly contradicting kant here in a very important way but he's you know he's not trying to be 100 percent faithful to kant either so just put that down um I, I i'll even put aside his his whole thing in itself terminology i'm asking like ask the question what is this will? How did you know? How do you know about it? How do you have access to this will that you're describing? It seems to be like an important part of the story here. And he seems to be saying we have an immediate access to the will, but it's also not a representation. And it's not something we infer. I think it's something we feel. I'm going to read the, sorry, read more of the uh, Beyond Good and Evil 36. It might, I mean, it might allow us to understand, so this is Nietzsche, it might allow us to understand the mechanistic world as belonging to the same plane of reality as our affects themselves, 
as a primitive form of the world of affect, where everything is contained in a powerful unity before branching off and organizing itself in the organic processes, process, and of course being softened and weakened. We would be able to understand the mechanistic world as a kind of life of the drives, where all the organic functions, self-regulation, assimilation, nutrition, excretion, and metabolism are still synthetically bound together as a preform of life. In the end, we are not only allowed to make such an attempt, the conscience of method demands it. Multiple varieties of causation should not be postulated until the attempt to make do with a single one has been taken as far as it will go. This is a moral of method that cannot be escaped these days. It follows, quote, from the definition, as a mathematician would say. The question is ultimately whether we recognize the will as, in effect, efficacious, whether we believe in the causality of the will. If we do, and this belief really is just our belief in causality itself, then we must make the attempt to hypothetically posit the causality of the will as the only type of causality there is. Will can naturally have effects only on will, and Schopenhauer says something similar to that in here, and not, and not on matter, not on nerves, for instance. Enough, we must venture the hypothesis that everywhere effects are recognized, will is effecting will and that every mechanistic event in which a force is active is really a force and effect of will. Assuming finally that we succeed in explaining our entire life of drives as the organization and outgrowth of one basic form of will, namely the will to power, which is my claim, assuming we could trace all organic functions back to this will to power and find that it even solved the problem of procreation and nutrition, then we will have earned the right clearly to designate all efficacious force as will to power. The world seen from inside, the world determined and described with respect to its intelligible character, which is something Schopenhauer also says, would be just the will to power and nothing else. And so maybe I'm reading uh, Schopenhauer again too much through Nietzsche, but it sounds, it sounds to me that Schopenhauer is saying some very, something very similar to that. Or I should say Nietzsche is saying something very similar to Schopenhauer there. And, and so, you know, my, my reading is that he's saying, because, you know, Schopenhauer explicitly says, um, you know, on page 136, let every force in nature be known as will. And, and so I think he's trying to reduce, you know, I think it's a metaphysics of the will. Um, and, and I think, you know, with regard to the immediate, immediate thing, I'm not sure how to thread that needle. I mean, one way I would, I might try is to, he might say, when I experience a drive, I am in, ex I am experiencing the will, you know, the cosmic will actualized through my own being and i experience it as a drive but i am experiencing the cosmic will you know as it is actualized in this body something like that that's um, that's I, i'm not sure that that answers your objections eric but that's my thinking i guess i'm also thinking that because he describes representation as kind of being within the subject object thing within causality and so I think for Schopenhauer, he's making some argument that our experience of kind of our body and like, I guess, our individual will, particular acts of will, there's some part of him that wants to claim that like we're experiencing that without subject object dichotomy. And I'm guessing like that's kind of maybe like his inlet to saying like, that's the thing that I experience is totally different from everything else. So it must be that thing that is kind of outside of all these other these forms of causality um, outside of representation and that's the thing that's it and then i guess he goes on to kind of make the argument of can i generalize that experience to these other things okay. yeah i think that's exactly what he means i think that kind of points to where i'm still having difficulty too i i when you know talking about having a feeling of one's drives or one's will 
already I'm put in a relationship that seems like subject object, you know, to have a feeling of anxiety because of the modern world, right? Already we're going to have a subject object relationship. And then to, I mean, also, and we have to, I guess we have to be careful, but if, it seems also the cosmic will might take the status of object. Only, only when you bring it into abstraction. Right, right, right. But I, you know, with regard to that, like you say, I experience, you know, like when I when I have a drive, there's already a subject there. I think what, you know, again, I I can't promise that this is really Schopenhauer instead of Nietzsche, but I think what you know what he might say is when I experience a drive, there is no I experiencing a drive. There is just experience of the drive. You know, and I think Nietzsche would say something like that. There is no subject experiencing something. There is just the experience. So that to experience a drive in kind of its purest form is, I, I don't experience that as something happening to me. I am that drive. I am, I mean, you know, I, I think he would say, strictly speaking, there is not even an I there. There is just this experience. And and in, and that, like Joey was saying, in that sense, the subject-object distinction evaporates. Ed, you've been trying to. No, you. I think you anticipated me because I was thinking more of like, um, like what one I you know, the word instinct or let me just get a very specific one, lust. You know, and so when you were talking, it, it, it. So what you're saying is you believe your understanding of Schopenhauer's point is that in that that lust is experienced holistically, not like a object subject. It's just it's literally visceral, right? It's the whole body, the whole organism is experiencing this. Yeah, see, that was the trouble I had with with another explanation, which I thought was over intellectualizing it, right? Like if try to explain sexual lust to somebody, you know, rationally. It, d does it work? I mean, d or or is something inherently missing from the description because of how visceral the sensation or the physicality of it is? Yeah, I think so. And I, you know, this reminds me of the sort of existentialist thing about, you know, I can't remember. I was trying to like compare Zen and existentialism, but there's, you know, there's what we what we tend to do is we tend to try to live life while thinking about how we're living our life. And so, you know, I I am simultaneously trying to be the participant and the observer. I'm experiencing life and at the same time trying to watch myself experiencing my life and reflecting on it. So I've got this sort of bifurcated consciousness and I can only ask questions about is life meaningful in that bifurcated mode, because in order to ask whether this life is meaningful, I have to separate myself from the life and observe it at the same time I'm living it. And and there's a, definitely a subject object ex experience there, but I but I I think and I'm wondering at what you know people like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche might say, is if you are li just living life, if you're living, you don't what you experience is living, you don't you know you're not watching yourself live, and so the experience of a passion, like if you're fully engaged, like really engaged in a passion or a drive or, and I think he would include instincts, you know, as part of that. If you're fully engaged in that, you're not reflecting on it and thinking about the fact that, oh, I am having this instinctive response <laughs> or you're, you, it, you're, you know, that's just what's happening. And, and so I, you know, my guess is that Schopenhauer and I think Nietzsche might be thinking of that sort of, that sort of direct experience of, you know, and then to say, you know, how can I, how can I say that that's, you know, something like some cosmic will or something, but I think that, you know, like Joey was saying, he's, he's at least makes a stab, and I'm guessing for the rest of this book, he's going to try to convince us of that, um, you know, but I think he does try to. 
I saw skepticism on Eric's face, more skepticism. <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I don't think he's done the epistemic labor, you know, of leading us step by step to this. Um, yeah, I don't think he, you know, I, I guess I'm falling. This is just reminding me again of this, like Hegel versus Deleuze, like mediation versus immediacy. And I guess almost just this sense of like, uh, and I, you know, I put it in the chat, but just the, um, and you see kind of like conversations nowadays, like in this kind of like contemplative neuroscience field where they're just looking at, you know, even the Dalai Lama being kind of like brought in and engaging with these discussions of like, is non-dual awareness a thing? Can we study it? And it, it kind of just like feels like this thing that's talked about in the texts and that people will practice tours and train tours and kind of just these direct experiences that might be like espoused from people's direct experience, but it's not something we like and can kind of put forth in a way that makes sense to, to someone who hasn't experienced it. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, like, that feels like it could definitely be something maybe Schopenhauer's pulling from his readings of those those texts, um, where it's just like, oh, yeah, they're, they're talking, whether he's experienced it or not, right? But like, oh, they're talking about it. Um, but yeah, it makes me wonder, like, did Schopenhauer experience this? And is it something, you know, would Schopenhauer say it's something that's like, not accessible to the everyman? Is it something that needs training to experience? And I guess that to me, yeah, it starts to speak to what Dylan put like the kind of like this gnosis idea of just like as if we might need training to have access to it. At least, I, you know, I'm making that connection because I know it. I think in the conversation and kind of meditation Buddhism around non dual awareness, I think it, the idea being that it, it does take training to have that experience. Um, well, I, you know, I was, that's kind of what I was thinking of too, when I was talking that way was, you know, non-dual experience. On the other hand, I wonder if there is an, if there, if we, if we have a more common access, not to non-dual experience, but at least something close to what he might, that, you know, this direct experience of the will, if you, you know, in, in um, flow, in flow experiences. Yeah. Well, so, I, I mean, I was going to appeal to Eric, you know, my, if you remember my illustration in class, when we were talking about eudaimonia when you're out there running on the soccer field and you're not i mean if you stop to reflect you're gonna mess up yeah that's <laughs> right that's right no but you know i was gonna speak to that too because you know when i hear non-dual consciousness that's one of the first things that comes to my mind is flow state i know it's not the same thing but it's approaching right uh, but uh so i'm trying i want to you know i i, I I can I can use my experiences on the soccer field flow state and kind of I can that's why I'm saying I can kind of gather Schopenhauer's meaning. I can read it and follow along and go, I get a feeling for your meaning. But when I take a step back and scrutinize it and go, what just happened here? What did he see? What am I supposed to see? Right. And already framing it that way, I see it's going to be put into subject object framing, right? But I can't help but see him doing this, you know putting it, it's, you know, it's over and over again in terms of subject object framing, but to the point about, um, sorry, flow state and, and the state of, you know, and the reflection or self-consciousness is sometimes being uh, put against, pit against non, non uh, dual consciousness or, or flow state. I, I, I take the point in, in the game, while the game's happening, that's not really the time to stop and reflect, you know, and to have to be self conscious about my time or what I'm doing there, right? But I wor I worry about negating self reflection and self consciousness altogether because my 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 as a soccer player, my flow states are much better because when I'm not on the field, I'm reflecting because I understand the theory of the game. So there's there's a time and place for self reflection, right? self-consciousness and there's a time and place for putting that aside and 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 engaging in something like flow state but i i'm i'm very wary of attitudes that privilege one and neglect the other right i i, I think being self-conscious all the time is very toxic and very bad for people but also refusing to be self-conscious at all or reflect i think i think we live in a society that is more in danger of that generally speaking people are not reflective enough 
So I take your overall point and I agree with you, Nevit, right? In terms of, you know, what he's getting at here, Schopenhauer, it's something like a flow state that I can relate to. And there's, there is something of value to this as well. But, you know, I also have reservations. And for the point, I, my overall point, I want to see Schopenhauer demonstrate it to me. You know, lead me through an argument. And it seems like he's indicating a feeling. So I, you know, I think, I mean, I, I don't think he would, I think he's on to what he's privileging this experience as an epistemological tool for discovering ultimate me or whatever he calls meaning, you know, because he thinks whatever, whatever, and I, you know, exactly whatever this meaning is, it is derived from what he discovers in these kinds of experiences. But that's not to say, I mean, so he privileges it in that sort of epistemolo epistemological and metaphysical sense, but I'm not sure he would, he would privilege it altogether because I mean, for God's sake, the whole book is a book on reflective cognition. And he says earlier, you know, we have to lift this into reflective cognition in order to examine it and talk about it and so on. And so I, I think he's, he's privileging it as a, you know, in a, in a sort of philosophical sense. I'm not sure he, he would, I don't think he would privilege it in all senses though. I guess, because that's where I was leaning to wondering if Eric, you felt like he was doing that. If Schopenhauer's kind of saying like, we should be in this state all the time. And I guess I'm leaning with what Nevitt's Nev saying that he's offering it as like, oh, look, that's a window. But naturally we have to kind of like come out of that and look and peer through that window to kind of like extract that, that value of getting the true meaning. And I guess raising the concrete cognition to abstract. And, but that, you know, it did make me wonder like, where would where might Schopenhauer fall just on that line of of where we should be, how we should live in relation to that? I, I guess I am recalling, and we haven't gotten there, but I'm wondering how his uh, negation of like individual will plays into that. Of maybe he does end up kind of leaning towards, and again, he didn't do that himself, right? And he says like, I'm not doing that, but <laughs> it's that idea of like, I wonder how that might align with this you know, this idea of like just being in kind of instinctual flow all the time. Um, I want to ask uh, Eric, I'm sorry, Ed, Ed, to cut you off, but I just want to ask Eric a sort of a side question. Is that a case of pragmatic self or whatever the pragmatic self-refutation or, or whatever? He doesn't practice what he preaches. Yeah, no, that's right. What was the, what was the term we had to, uh, um, uh, Christian? Um, dem well, dem uh, Demonstrative contradiction, a contradiction, or performative contradiction. Performative contradiction. Right. Yeah, no, I wouldn't call that a performative contradiction. Okay. I'd call that being a hypocrite. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, think open, I think I recall like maybe a part of that quote was just like, I'm a human being with drives and instincts. Like, I can't help it. Like, you know, I, you know, I, I would like to, but. Yeah, he, he's a kind of determinist, isn't he? So. He's, <laughs> Maybe he just say, eh, I was determined to be this, to be such an asshole. Get well, over. I mean, if, if I can. Sure. If I can haphazardly defend the old fart. Um, <laughs> I mean, jump forward. Okay. And I'm not saying Freud doesn't have his issues, but isn't there something fairly strong in the Western tradition starting, at least with Freud, maybe going back to Schopenhauer saying, we put so many constraints on ourselves, societal rules, that we don't even really know what we really want, right? That we check ourselves sexually, that we check ourselves emotionally, that um, you're not, I mean, look at it. I mean, the upper classes in Britain, you're not supposed to show emotion. That's gauche. And how they ever came up with a system where you're supposed to have a family unit that doesn't exist as a family unit. We're gonna sh we're gonna ship off Reginald to this concentration camp that's called a school like Hogsworth, and you know God forbid he's the goat, where he's in effect tortured for years on end because for some reason he said left instead of right, 
uh, and um, and somehow the kid we're not going to see our own son for five years. You know, maybe at Christmas, which you know, whatever. Um, you know, if if Schopenhauer is saying, wouldn't it be a good idea for us to be truly more begging your pardon for the language in tune with our real emotions and our real drives i don't know i don't know enough about to, frankly to me that sounds more like nietzsche but um <laughs> but, but nietzsche Begging your pardon, everybody tonight sounds like Nietzsche. It seems. <laughs> yeah, everything sounds like Nietzsche to me. Um, I'm just teaching. But I, <laughs> no, that's true. That's a, that's a that's a disease you get. Like everything sounds like Deleuze to Chase, and everything sounds like Hegel to Hunter, and and so on. Um, but what but what I mean is, I think you know Nietzsche borrowed a whole lot from Schopenhauer. But I you know Schopenhauer, the, the impression I get, it, you know, he says. All of this desiring and willing and all this stuff, this is the source of suffering, which, you know, is, again, similar to Stoicism and Buddhism and so on. And but it seems like Schopenhauer either explicitly or implicitly wants to say and suffering is something we should eliminate. Whereas, you know, Nietzsche, I think, says agrees and says, yeah, yeah, all this stuff really is suffering. But if you're a certain kind of individual you know he said you know like Nietzsche says there are basically two kinds of people in the world people who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't no that's not that's not what actually says but he, he says there are two kinds of people in the world those who experience suffering as an objection to life and those who experience suffering as an enticement to life and so you know I think Nietzsche would characterize Schopenhauer as one who experiences suffering as an objection to life and so you know, I don't know how Aunt, what Schopenhauer would say about, you know, what you what you he, he might agree with you. I really don't know, but the but I think he would say that nevertheless, even living this kind of life. So if you live a life that is engaged in, you know, where you're engaged in your passions and you're giving them full play and you're you know you're doing all this stuff, I think Nietzsche's going to or uh, Schopenhauer is going to say, but that's going to cause a lot of suffering. And he seems to think, and suffering is a bad thing. Whereas I think Nietzsche might say, yeah, that's going to cause a lot of suffering. So that's just kind of the price you pay for living a really passionate, exciting life. Well, I just put it in the chat. Schopenhauer did, you know, he rejected his own, <laughs> his own objection. Is that right? Again, he ends up living just like you know, enjoying his fame and indulging in music and socializing and just, you know, this is kind of like. And that's funny. So maybe he, maybe he, that's funny. So he, he lived more according to Nietzsche's prescriptions. <laughs> that's funny. Nietzsche, the true Schopenhauer. <laughs> maybe Nietzsche knew that. I wonder if he knew that and was like, well, you know, there you go. There's that guy. He's doing what I said you ought to do. It's just that. His philosophy is kind of backward. <laughs> so yeah, maybe he would agree with that. I don't know. No, no, no. If 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 I misunderstood Schopenhauer and then your all interpretations of him, I mean, I I, I want to know. Uh, so if, if the way you responded, then it sounds like. I mean, it's it's like the exact opposite. What Schopenhauer is saying is. He's trying to get a handle on what could be called impulse, um, and uh, would, and again, I'm, I'm still having trouble. Obviously, will the concept of will is extraordinarily important, but is that something different from, you know, self discipline or impulse, you know, instinct, uh, reason? Um, right, because in 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 later in the 1800s, when people talk about will, it's it seems like it's a, it's a real self disciplined act to modify one's behavior 
to either achieve one's goals or to live rightly, correctly. So, you know, a complicating factor here is, yeah, I mean, that is a, a difficult question. So, you know, for, so it, or, uh, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but for, for Nietzsche, I'm sorry, for, for Kant, the will is a distinct faculty from passions and drives and instincts and all that kind of stuff. So you have a will, a rational will that can make free choices that may go completely against all of your instincts and drives and passions and so on. Now, again, I may be reading Nietzsche into Schopenhauer, but but even from what I what he sees, what I've seen in this chapter, I think he my guess is that Schopenhauer would say what I experience as will, as choosing, is really just one of those drives or passions or instincts. I experience it as a choice, but I don't think, I'm, I'm guessing Schopenhauer is going to disagree with Kant in saying that there is a, in my individual person, that there is a will that is distinct from that stuff. But, and and again, I'm, I haven't read ahead, so here I'm working off things that I vaguely remember or have heard people talk about when they talk about Schopenhauer, that will, sometimes with a capital W, is this pervasive cosmic, I don't know what to call it, willing there's the there's this it's like a metaphysical i think of it as a field of force there's like this metaphysical will that manifests as things we experience in the material world and and what and what i can what manifests what the most direct way i experience that cosmic will is when it manifests in me as drives instincts passions and so on but i, I you know, again, I have a, I don't know Schopenhauer enough to, to say this for sure, but I'm, I'm guessing that he would disagree with Kant when Kant says you have a will and then you've got all these passions and drives and stuff. I think I'm guessing Schopenhauer is going to say, no, there's really just all the passions and drives and stuff. And we experience a choice. I think I'm making a free choice, but really that choice is motivated by some, not by a will, but by some, I mean, not by a will that's distinct from all those other motivations, but is just another, another one of those, you know, motivations. That's my guess. I don't know why any, any of you other guys, Eric or Joey, have that sense of where he's headed? I would, I would kind of modify a little bit by it seems like the drives and passions are take place within the field of will, right? Will, will, but, uh, and will also will is the thing in itself. I think that's, you know, I feel like that's important for Schopenhauer, but um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I don't remember, ex you know, exactly how are you, you were putting it together there, Nevit. Um, it's not that, not the case that the will is, is the, like some total of all our drives and passions, but the the ground is is that is that more the direction right? The will is the ground for drives passions. That sounds right. Right, and the way I'm reading the way I'm reading Schopenhauer is that I think we're going to get to a cosmic will, you know, the the cosmic will. But right now he seems to be talking about individual wills. My will, I experience my will, and it seems to me like that's. You know, I like, I don't know, I'm I'm thinking of that as like one spore in a giant fungus, you know, you know, like I right one fungus underneath the ground, but there's lots of caps that pop up. Does that make sense? I, each of these caps can be appear to be an individual organism, but it's not. It's really just one piece of one large organism. So the true would, sense of the cosmic will. Right, or right. the individual no well the relationship between individual and cosmic will uh. so that when you experience your choice you are actually experiencing your choice but realize that it's not your choice distinct from the cosmic choice either so i would i would just i i guess agree with most of what you said except on that point Nevin. 
because I, I don't I'm, I'm not reading Schopenhauer as saying when you when you experience your choice that's an illusion that really it's the cosmos deciding for you but it is your choice it's just also the cosmos cosmos's choice so it's not so much an illusion it's just the individuation of the will through you presents itself as such not as, it's not illusion as such Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm having a hard time seeing the distinction <laughs> between those two. I, uh, Joey, I, I was trying to find where you were referring to on page 130 when you said the will and its degrees of appearances, because I thought that seemed to be important. It's about in the very middle of that, that top passage. And it starts with, I say, according to its innermost essence. So I, I guess I'm seeing him like distinguish like the essence of the will from its like degrees of appearances, which I think is in line with the question we're exploring right now, which I see being to what extent, how will Schopenhauer distinguish like our individual acts from this kind of cosmos will? And I feel like, I don't know if he, he didn't like talk about it right there but i feel like he kind of just references it um we must first get to know this essence of the will better so that we can distinguish what is it what it is in itself from the many degrees of its appearance of its appearance yeah and then and then look at the next sentence for instance the wills being accompanied by cognition and its determination by motives that are conditioned by this these as we will see in what follows do not belong to its essence but only to its clearest appearance as animals and human beings. So that's that's the kind of you know language that it seems to me he's saying, you know, we that the 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 will in its essence is this thing in itself. Um and and the way it the way we experience it or the way it manifests in our bodies are through these, you know, drives and instincts and feelings and so on. Those are that's the way it appears. Because I I can't, you know, I can, I have an experience of love. And when I'm in the middle of the experience, maybe I'm not thinking about it, but I can reflect on it and realize that that was an experience. And so, it, you know, it, it's amenable to cognition, whereas I think the essence of the will, you know, on my reading, which manifests as that feeling, is not directly accessible. So that's, but that kind of, that kind of goes against the passages you were citing earlier you know, when he says that, when he does seem to say we have this immediate access to it. So I, I'm not sure. It seems like there is that, like that, yeah, that generalization that he almost sees as necessary, or like, I guess it almost seems like an inference in that case of that, that jump. But even, even the next sentence, I think is interesting. The one after the one you read, Nevada, when I say the force propelling a stone to earth, according to its essence in itself, aside from all representation, will, is will, then this should not be given the absurd meaning that the stone is moved by a motive and cognition, just because that is how the will appears in human being. Mm -hmm. He's kind of pointing to that idea of, I guess, us seeing that, like, oh, I'm moved by my own, like, motivated will. But, yeah, I mean, it's like, I'm sorry, compare in terms of what the, what our motives and our cognition is, conditioning the will i don't know how much power that has or what i guess what that means to him yeah i mean i i see him there again i think like nietzsche like trying to reduce the like when when um nietzsche talks about mere mechanism can you reduce mere mechanism to will and it seems like he's doing something like that here when he talks about, yeah, you know, for because he again he explicitly says some places what we think of as forces we don't have access to. Uh, you know, he's agree, it seems to me he's agreeing with Hume there. You know, we don't have access to the inner essence of physical things that we interpret as forces, but that we do have access, you know, this the manifestation of will within our beings and. I mean, he's it seems like uh, Schopenhauer is more strident than Nietzsche. Nietzsche says we should make the experiment <laughs> to see if we could account for all of this in terms of will. And Schopenhauer just to be saying seems to be saying no, it's will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I I 
kind of see him when he's talking about the like provisional talk. I guess maybe I'm being sympathetic to him, but it's almost just like he's like, I've already done the experiment. Let me show it to you. Maybe Nietzsche's just like, let's try it. Yeah, uh, but isn't that if, if Joey, if you're correct, I mean, and I know you're you're saying things kind of euphemistically, you know, more, you know, not philosophical language, but like you know, just natural conversational language. But if 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 you're onto something with Schopenhauer, isn't he? Either he's extraordinarily arrogant, or and or he's making some kind of epistemological claim, right? That if he's saying, I've experienced it, and this is how I've experienced it, therefore, this is how it is experienced by other human beings, he, he would have to be saying that there's this vast commonality of human experience when it comes to very important things, processes, right? Or else it would be untenable for him to say he was the reference, reference point and then from that, I can right spool it out and say, yeah, it, 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 it's it's true for all of us. All right, you, but you, you, he's making the claim as if to say, like, you felt it too. You know, like it's it's already true for you too. I don't, as opposed to just kind of like, I know it's the case. Trust me. And yeah, well, but how does he know it's true for the rest of us? Well, I mean, I think he would, you know, again, maybe I'm reading Nietzsche into it, but I think he would say, if you've experienced drives, instincts, affects, you've experienced it. And to, you know, and if you say, well, I haven't experienced those things, he'd be like, okay, well, <laughs> sorry, can't talk to you. But I mean, I think he would just assume every human being, I mean, I, with maybe some exceptions in people who have certain kind of psych psychiatric disorders, surely every human being has experienced drives, instincts, passions, and so on. Well, well, yeah, but it, but in the past when we've been talking about different philosophers, we've been concerned about language and terminology and equivalencies and I agree with Eric. I know it's sideways. Zuckerman doesn't count as a human being. Amen, brother. Thank you. Um, but uh, I mean, if you looked at it, I, I saw a photograph of him that was in the New York Times. And I swear to God, if you took the suit off of him, he was he was an alien from another planet. Very elongated face. It was scary. I thought one, one of Roger Smith's from the American Dad's the relative was scary. Um, but but in all seriousness, Nevit, you know, it's like, yes, you and I could both use words like, yes, I, I've experienced drives, instincts, passion, impulse. But then that would be, and then to say, therefore, yes, we can extrapolate this at all, dare we say, normal within a certain mean. Um, experience it, and, and and I can universalize it. But in the past, it seemed like people were very concerned about universalizing, that it was like, how do you know that that is actually the lived experience like another person would experience, even if we are using the same words concept for that? Um, well, I mean, down that road, it seems to be solipsism. You know, where the only thing you can know is your own internal states and and you can't and so then you can't say anything about anybody else's experience. But yeah. I mean, I, I guess maybe maybe to support your point a little bit, you know, if you think about the way Kant goes at questions of of objectivity, you know, what we can all know he relies upon reason to provide that you know he thinks that you can you can do this transit this transcendental deduction using reason to show that all rational all finite rational beings have certain kinds of cognitive structures like every finite rational being and so he uses a rational argument whereas schopenhauer seems to be appealing something to like immediate feeling something like that and um 
You know, I don't know. Um, I'm recalling uh, Schopenhauer is like when he was talking about the mathematical proofs and him kind of saying, and it seems like he's like extending his trust to these like other forms of, of experiencing or knowing. And I'm recalling him talking about the mathematical proofs when he's like, it's like we're looking at, you know, a puddle of water on a sidewalk that's totally safe to walk on, but we're afraid to walk on it. So we're just, we're walking to the side of it. And, mm -hmm. you, know, I, I, you know, I'm recalling him of, it sounded like he was kind of accusing like, you know, the mathematical proofs of kind of doing this like dance that is just kind of unnecessary. And I'm, you know, I maybe see that showing up here too, or he seems to just kind of have trust that he can make this claim about direct experience and that's you know, in the direction of that too, without, without fear that, you know, we're going to, we're going to drown if we trust it. You know, he might say, you know, like, like Hume at one point says, I don't experience a self internally. I don't find a self like a, I don't find a permanent, consistent self entity within myself. And then he says, if someone tells me, well, I do, I have experience of that. Hume's like, okay, fine. We're going to go our separate ways because I don't, and I don't think most of humankind does either, but I just can't talk to you anymore. And Schopenhauer might say something like that. He might say, I'm just accepting as kind of an axiom that every human being has an experience of passions, feelings, drives, and instincts. And if you tell me you don't, okay. But I think you're being duplicitous. He might say something like that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's going to develop this a lot more as we go into the book. It, um, I, my, my misgivings are still in place because, it, which is what we point to, he's demonstrating by by alluding to a feeling, and the you know this is this is the will, cosmic will eventually, right? It's like the it's the whole inside of the universe seen from the inside, right? It's 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 not an inconsequential detail or a minor part in a system. It's like it's all there is when looked at from one particular angle, the will. And the way we get to it, the way you, you, our deduction, it's not it's a non-deduction. You know what I mean? It's the the way Schopenhauer introduces it and builds from it, it's it seems rather flimsy. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not saying like like I said earlier, I can read it and follow along and understand what he's saying. It just you in you know you got you under, you can appreciate you know generations of philosophers putting out systems and getting criticized all to hell from anybody who ever came after. You know you know that's the nature of the game, right? Like you espouse your philosophy and and then everybody's going to come and rip it to shreds because that's what they do. So it's curious to me that like this section was kind of built in that way, you know, it, it doesn't, I, you know what I mean? If, if there are skeptics coming to criticize, what do you say? Sorry, dude, it's just a feeling. You know what I mean? Like I'm saying, I can sympathize and follow it along. It's just when I take a step back and try to analyze the work that's been done, I'm like how does, how is that gonna withstand criticism from all comers? So, uh, you know, one thing, I think he does give an argument again in this section. Um, I had a hard time following it. And I think it, it's probably, since I can't say since I had a hard time following it, it is incomplete and superficial. But maybe it is a prolegomena, maybe, I don't know, to a more, you know, to a more rigorous argument, like you said, in the rest of the book. Um, another, but another thing, and I, I, it seems like Schopenhauer is is more dogmatic which is, I'm sure, a word he would not like than, than this. But here's my sort of the way I, I, I read Nietzsche thinking about this, which is at least similar. It, you know, so the way I, I read Nietzsche, it's, it's almost like a pragmatic abduction kind of thing going on. So, you know, if you think like Hume's criticism is that we have exactly zero access to the world as it is in itself. Zero. And so Hume's solution is, so you, you shouldn't talk about things like, I mean, you, you shouldn't talk, you shouldn't make metaphysical claims about force and energy and power, because 
you just don't have access to it. All you have access to is constant conjunction. You don't have any access to all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, the, the sort of pragmatic argument is that the only thing, the only, um, the only direct experience I have of, to use Nietzsche's terms, cause is my you know, what happens inside my own body. So the only direct experience I have of causal force and power is my own manifestations of my own will, you know, in scare quotes. And so as a pragmatic tool, I, this is what I think Nietzsche would say, uh, you know, abduction or, you know, to the uh, inference to the best explanation or maybe the only possible explanation, like he, like Nietzsche puts it, we had at least run this experiment to see whether you could account for all of these forces and things in terms of will, because that I do have access to. Hume's right. I don't have access to it out there and those other things, but I do have access to this. And Schopenhauer makes very similar comments in this section, right? You know, it's like, I have this experience, and so I'm going to make this, you know, say that this is what's happening in the world as well. It's just that he... Whereas Nietzsche seems presents it as kind of an experiment. I actually think Nietzsche does believe that, by the way. But he presents it with it with more modestly. It seems like Schopenhauer is making a similar argument in that if this is the only kind of causal experience I can have, literally, it's the only thing I can have. I I cannot experience impulse, momentum, gravity electromagnetism i have zero access to that so the only thing i have access to along those lines is what i experience within myself but then you know he seems to make again a more like you say a more um strident dogmatic conclusion that so that is exactly what's going on in the universe um does schopenhauer sets up so that we have knowledge of causation through intuition um i don't it, it isn't immediate so so there's a privileged access you know the, the immediate object gives us pretty privileged access he does he doesn't he doesn't go as far as hume right to say you know we don't have knowledge of causes outside of us i thought, I thought I he think, got pretty damn close so this is this is on page 121 at the very bottom where he's talking about why natural science will not give us what we're looking for. Um, this is like a few lines down in the last bottom paragraph. Etiology, for its part, tells us that someone, some one determinate state of matter will lead to some other according to the law of cause and effect. And with this, it has explained the second state of matter and done its job. But in fact, it has done nothing more than establish the law-like order in which states emerge in space and time and tell us in each case what appearance will necessarily emerge at a given time and place. So it determines their position in time and space according to the law whose determinate content has been given by experience and yet whose general form and necessity we are aware of independently of experience. But this does not shed any light at all on the inner essence of any of those appearances. The inner essence is called natural force and lies outside the ambit of ideological explanation. And so, I mean, he seems to be pretty, pretty close to Hume there. No, you're right there. Um... In the in the first section of this book, he's very yeah. Um, he does he takes what you know Kant's notion of cause out of concepts and wraps it into intuition in such a way that he talks about animals having knowledge of cause and effect. It's but this is Kant, right. We're reading in we're kind passage, of reading cause and effect into things. Right. 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 Um, and because cause and effect ultimately for Schopenhauer is will is like it's a force expression of what is ultimately will. The the reason why I'm I apologize I'm getting more confused and so that's typical for is, us. Um, 
I thought in previous conversations, not necessarily about Schopenhauer, but uh, philosophy writ large, that Nevid, I thought you had more of a position, begging your pardon, that was closer to Hume than the others, because when when I talked about, say, um, you know, when I don't know if you remember, but we uh, towards the end of one of our uh, Zoom meetings, I was expressing a concern about uh, the United States going uh, towards a dictatorship, some kind of dictatorship and saying, you know, that it seems to me to do violence to, you know, foundational principles that the government of the United States and the states are supposed to be a part of. And you basically said, well, yeah, but that's your opinion. There, there are no kinds of... Um, that there's no, well, you didn't use the word transcendental, but that that it was basically any opinion about political organization is just that it's an opinion that there's there's no agreed upon principles. You can't get that. Uh, you know, maybe someone you know could make a very articulate position for a type of fascist government. And at another time, I thought that you questioned. Like, you know, the idea of natural science presupposes a world external to the observer. Uh, that's why they can use word, a word like discover, you know, uh, 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 you know, the Americas were discovered or a star was discovered. Uh, it was already there, obviously, but there was no human observation of it. And so, you know, the natural sciences presuppose a world independent of our observation of it and i and i thought at times you were saying yeah but how how do they know that you know isn't the observation limited by the sensory perceptions of human beings and so whatever is observed is limited because human beings are doing the observing and so if you had a different kind of intelligent rational being you know maybe the observation of quote unquote, the external world would be quite different. And so it, but then you, you, you seem very supportive of Schopenhauer saying, I've got drives, I've got passions, I've got instincts, and so do you. And if you don't, well, that that's on you. But that the overwhelming percentage of human beings have this. And I can, and I, Schopenhauer, can create a vocabulary that can lead to intersubjective understanding. If, if, if nothing else, at least intersubjective understanding, even if it can't, if, even if we can't agree on objective human experience, we can agree that there's shared intersubjective experience. Okay, so that's a lot to unpack. Um, so the saying that we all have experience of drives and feelings and so on, does not make any, you know, what philosophers would call a normative claim. Right. It, it's not making any claim about what should be. It's just saying, this is part of what it means to be a human being is to have these kind of drives and feelings. You know, the question about like, you know, political, where there's an object, whether there are any objective moral standards or objective political standards um, is a different question. Yes. You know, so, and, and, you know, I can say, I surely, I surely don't know, you know, I cannot know what's happening into another, another person's uh, mind, but, um, you know, you, I'm taking as sort of an axiom that all human beings have feelings and drives and so on. But that's, you know, again, that's not, that's not making a normative claim about what the world is like or what sure. what that you know what values are are correct or incorrect but it uh, is an empirical in some way statement isn't it yes so i'm still i'm still not quite getting the you know so so here's you know like one way you know nietzsche would cat would would say is that my values are actually an artifact of my drives and instincts and so on and that your values are just they are your values because they're based on your feelings and your experiences so that 
you know, that kind of claim says, you know, acknowledges that we all do have drives and instincts and so on, but it denies that the that values that there are any absolute values that transcend, you know, the individual's uh, feelings and so on. So those two are not, I don't think, incompatible. Those, you know, the claim that there are no absolute universal values and the claim that human beings by nature have feelings and drives, those don't seem to be incompatible claims to me. But I mean, the idea of like intersubjective knowledge. Um, well, I guess you could say, I know. So you're saying something like I say, I know that every person has feelings and and drives. Um, I guess I would say, strictly speaking, I can't say that. I mean, and that's, I don't know. I mean, that's just not Nietzsche. That's just, I can't, I cannot possibly get inside anybody else's mind. And so, you know, if you want to, it seems to me, if you want to be very careful, the, you know, the only, the only thing I can know with absolute confidence is stuff that I experience within my own mind. And the, the, the thing is, if you, if that's, if that's where you stay, you can make no knowledge claims of any kind at all. And so if you want to make any kind of knowledge claims, they have to be on, on some kind of basis. And so, you know, I could say, I'm going to lay down as an axiom, let's say, that all human beings have feelings and drives. Um, but if you challenge that, or maybe not even an axiom, lay it down as a presupposition or something. And if you deny that presupposition, then, you know, there's not nothing more I can do about that. You know, again, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, what, you know, uh, Kant starts kind of at that place where the only thing I can know is what I have experience of. But then he makes these claims that because I am a rational being, there are certain kind of cognitive structures that I experience and any rational being. He has, you know, he, he tries to construct these arguments that says any rational being, any finite rational being will have these same cognitive structures. And so that means that we can have objective knowledge because we all, all rational finite beings experience the world in the same kind of way. So, you know, this is, I don't know if it's a feature of, I, I'm, I hesitate to say continental philosophy, but a big, you know, one stream of continental philosophy tends to start from, from it's, a, you know, sort of a Carti Descartes, a Cartesian experience, uh, claim, what I, what I know best is what I can experience within my own personal experience. And anything that, anything I want, any knowledge claims or any claims of objectivity, I have to start with that essential subjectivity and then build out from there and try to, try to deduce or infer that there are certain grounds for shared knowledge and, and different people do that in different ways and some people come up with you know some people might say there are just absolutely no grounds for absolute objective knowledge the best you can do is come up with probabilistic arguments or um you know, you lay down these principles, like I say, you lay that, lay this down as a principle. And if someone says, I don't believe that principle, well, then uh, we can't really have a conversation. Other people like Kant thinks he can prove that there are these absolute objective, you know, truths for all rational beings. So, okay. Sorry. Well, no, no, thanks but, for engaging me because I, I hope you didn't think I was, uh, <laughs> you know, poking at you because I've really learned so much in these last. I can't believe we start. I started with with you all like before the pandemic, <laughs> and sometimes it just seems like a blur. Like Hegel, Spinoza, you know, it's like if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. You know, <laughs> like I'm, what semester did we read what? So I very much appreciate it. And I just th this. It's just when you were defending, and it, you know, I I I don't have a sense of Schopenhauer yet to, to to in my limited way to say I agree disagree but it sounded 
like you were defending them in a way that you were more questioning and with other philosophers. And so I just, you know, that was, that was just interesting to me. So. Well, I, you know, I, I thank you for bringing that up. I mean, frankly, I'm not, I mean, I have not completely convinced myself that I've answered your question adequately. So, uh, you know, your, you know, your question is, is going to make me go off and, and have, I think the, the simple answer is Schopenhauer sounds like Nietzsche. <laughs> yeah. No, I guess I, I probably hear my fault. <laughs> it's it's his instincts. <laughs> yeah. I can't help it. But no, I'm I am i am the same way. Um so the thought I had never when you said got with us before COVID, to think what would our interaction have been like on the sidewalk if COVID had already started? <laughs> Would it have happened? Who knows? Right, um, right. But the other thought I had is just was kind of background when we were talking earlier about Schopenhauer's really leaning on this conversation of like forces. And it's making me recall, and I don't at all remember what Hegel said about forces, but I did I mean, not understand that. So. It's in that discussion, it makes me think like, did Hegel already subvert this, this consideration? You know, maybe it put people off. <laughs> There's a whole section in the phenomenology that's notorious. It's like what it's honestly among Hegel scholars, it's often regarded as one of the most opaque sections in, in the phenomenology. That makes yeah. me feel a little bit better because I couldn't make heads or tails that section. It's completely confusing. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh I'm just uh starting to lose it. Um and uh, I wish I could stay longer because it's always did you ever see, do you remember that old uh, Far Side cartoon? This strange looking kid raises his hand to the teacher and says, Mr. Ferguson, can I be excused? My brain is full. And that's what I think of so many times when I'm with this seminar. It's like, ah, my brain is full. I can't, I can't function anymore. Sorry to trigger y'all with hey, well, so, some, <laughs> Sometime I'd like to re return to that, you know, when you said, uh, when, when I, I, you said that I said, well, that's just your opinion. You know, my my view is not quite that cynical. So I, you know, some at some point in the future, I'd like to revisit that. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, always. Yeah, always. You know, yeah. every every book we read, we have to have a equal defenders and skeptics. No, I think it makes it better because it just it forces the working through of the material much more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I honestly do appreciate when you bring up objections to what you said back there. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> it's like, you know, students do that to me in class sometimes. But that's, but that's, I consider that a, a good thing, you know, because it, you know, it may, it may be a real problem in my. Well, no, it's just, but also it's, 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 it's a testament to you. It means people are listening. Yeah. You know, it's like it's not like oh, the old guy's talking again. You know, let me check my like my messages. You know, I mean, you know, you've read an awful lot, so yeah. There's there's the five or ten students in there who are listening. <laughs> well, in the class of thirty. <laughs> that's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. You all be safe. Some of you, I guess, I'll see you on Monday. Please have a safe weekend. Sounds good. Thank you for your bye -bye. time.